All right, I think we're okay. I see we're streaming live, yeah? Yes. Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome to another Facebook Live event. My name is Kevin Bradley and um, wow, what a special day it is today. I guess a lot of people are aware that this is the first day of spring, but uh, that's not why we're here. We're actually here because it's Sleep um, Apnea Awareness Day. So I'm really, really happy to have, I'll introduce Justine first, who many of you know, Justine Amder. Thank you for joining us. And I'm delighted to have Aaron Taylor here with me as well. And yeah. Aaron has quite a compelling story um, that we'll get to shortly. Uh, she was diagnosed with sleep apnea about a year and a half ago. Uh, welcome, Aaron. Thank you. And then um, over in the Bay Area, I have Anne Curry. Um, who also has a different sort of journey that she'll discuss. And um, Anne was diagnosed around six years ago with sleep apnea. And we'll be talking about more or less the awareness that um, brought you to the fact that you had an issue with sleep apnea. So, Marin, if I could start with you, please. Um, you know, I'd like you, even though I introduced you, to just give us a little bit of your story. Um, how you got involved with this and, and what led to the, the fact that you became aware that you actually had an issue with sleep apnea? Sure. Um, well, I started showing symptoms of sleep apnea when I had my first son, Jason, in 2010. And uh, a lot of it, I just chalked up to, um, you know, just being a new mom for the first time. And uh, you know, I was having a lot of daytime sleepiness and fatigue and trouble with memory and concentration, really fragmented sleep. Uh, a lot of problems like that was having some depression and thought it was postpartum depression. And I'd had a gestational diabetes during my pregnancy too, so it hadn't been the, the easiest pregnancy. And, um, but I didn't get diagnosed for a long time. Uh, it wasn't until my parents were diagnosed with sleep apnea in 2014. And even then, when they described their symptoms to me and, and told me for the first time what sleep apnea is, which I hadn't even heard of it before, um, I still was kind of in denial. I was like, oh, I can't have that. I'm too young. I'm a woman. I, you know, I just don't fit the profile. I don't have the high blood pressure, that kind of thing. Um, but in 2017, my symptoms started getting really bad. And so I, uh, I did get into my doctor and talked to her about getting tested and I was diagnosed. So. Great. And I mean, I, I think it's because you had experience with that, um, being that your parents had sleep apnea, that um, it made you maybe aware of the fact that that could be something that you're going through. I'm interested as well as um, how did your family physician react when you um, came in with these symptoms and what, what were their, what was the plan for you? Well, um, I'm lucky. I have a really great family physician. And as soon as I told her there was a family history of this and that I was showing the symptoms, she recommended me to go into a sleep study right away. So that was great. But the thing was, you know, over the seven or so years I'd, I'd been experiencing the symptoms, I'd mentioned them to her on different occasions, like, oh, I'm snoring really heavily. Uh, is there anything we can do about that? And she's like, well, not a whole lot. Try this and that, just sort of over the counter thing. Or, you know, we were treating the depression separately and, you know, other symptoms. And she just didn't know to put all that together. So she was extremely helpful once I brought the idea to her, but she just wasn't trained to set, to put that collection of symptoms together and say, oh, that might be sleep apnea. We need to get you in and get you tested. Sure, sure. And I'll leave you a minute, Erin, um, and go to Anne. So, Anne, your journey is a little bit different. Um, you were diagnosed, what, a year and a half ago. Can you give me an example of some of the symptoms you were having as well and what made you come to the realization that you needed to seek help for your condition? Right. So I was actually diagnosed with sleep apnea six years ago, but my journey is a little bit different because... Sorry, sorry. Yes. Went <laughs> my, no, um, I initially 
went to my allergist because I was having severe allergies with no relief from over-the-counter medication. And so I'd found a new allergist that was at Stanford to try to see if there was anything that could be given to me. Besides the allergies, I also had some severe headaches in the morning. And then I also was waking up in the middle of the night unable to breathe. And I kind of thought that that had something to do with allergies. So I kind of put that all in the same bucket. The other thing is I'd had a history of anaphylaxis. Um, and so when I was having problems breathing, it was really alarming to me because I was a new mom with a two-year-old and I was having these episodes in the middle of the night that I just wasn't sure if it was something that I should just wake up and get a glass of water and go back to bed or if I should go and call 911 getting ready for um, you know, going into full-on anaphylaxis. And so that became more worrisome and I was just tired all the time. And, you know, I think the fact that you're a new mom with a, a two-year-old and I had a big corporate job and a significant commute, you know, I was, of course, I'm tired all the time. You know, I'm going to present to a doctor and they're just going to say, hey, you know, you're a 42-year-old woman, you know, that's, that's the way life is. And so when I went to the allergist, you know, I didn't really think about the other symptoms, the tiredness and the headaches. All I could really talk about was the allergies. And I was lucky that the allergist that I went to at Stanford had um, a lot of experience with sleep apnea. And so she kept telling me that, you know, I remember the course of the first appointment that she thought it was sleep apnea. And had I ever had a sleep test that it run in my family? Well, yes, it did run in my family. But um, I was sure it was not sleep apnea because like Aaron, I didn't fit the profile. You know, I, I thought of sleep apnea as something that men get overweight, thick neck. There was just, I just didn't fit that profile. And so I remember going back and forth with her over several months, fighting this, you know, the idea of going in for a sleep study, even though my allergies at that time were completely off the charts and there was nothing to really point a finger at to say why the allergies had gotten so bad and why I was an outlier in her process, in her, in her um, practice, that is. And so it wasn't until finally that like Aaron, you just are so tired and it's just, you just get sad because you're so exhausted that I finally decided to get a sleep study, if nothing else, to prove her wrong. And there at Stanford in the sleep clinic, I was diagnosed with sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea. Right, right. You know, and you were quite lucky you had someone that, um, you know, that was on their radar for you. Um, because I guess, you know, when we're talking about awareness, a lot of people are, you know, going to maybe family physicians and don't get the answers they, they deserve. And, you know, when we're talking about this being more on the forefront, it's not only about the people that are suffering from sleep apnea that um, need to be aware. It's wanting people to be advocates for themselves and saying, hey, you know, this is something that could be going on with me. Now, I am curious to figure out that, you know, say, Aaron, when you were going through this initially, what did you do any research? Or what was out there to sort of help you figure out? Um. I, I did do a little bit of research once I found out my parents had sleep apnea and you know I, I knew the name and knew what to look into I did actually look up a bit and um, you know it, a lot of it matched my symptoms I mean the uh, feeling of not being able to breathe at night and waking up continually waking up a lot during the night the heavy snoring the daytime sleepiness uh, the you know problems with memory and concentration so I, I saw a lot of that but I was I was still reluctant to go in and get treated because, you know, I was afraid of using the CPAP and didn't want to, you know, have to use that. And I was afraid about, you know, you know, when money's tight, it's really hard to admit you might have a big medical condition that's going to need an expensive sleep study and, and, uh, you know, a uh, ongoing treatment. So, so I did. I did a bit of research on it, but I was still a bit in denial that that could be the problem. Yeah, and you, Anne. I know your physician was um, right there 
at the forefront for you and um, probably diagnosed you pretty earlier on. But what about you? Did you feel like you, I know you felt you didn't fit that profile, but what made you become aware of the fact that this is something that could be of a concern for you? Well, I think because my allergies kept getting worse. I mean, I think that's as a first point, I wanted to try to clean that up because I knew that it was just getting to the point with my allergies that I would take my two-year-old to the playground. And as soon as we walked back into the house, we both, everybody had to take showers to wash all the particulate matter off of it and not bring it back into the house. So, I mean, it was really getting in and it was disrupting everybody's life in our house because if I even didn't wash off after the playground I would be without a voice and be in bed for at least a week with such severe allergies and so you know I think after a while my husband and I just realized that something we needed to you know, something had to change. And initially we started the CPAP, but because of my severe allergies, the CPAP was really hard to use because you have to blow the air through your nose. And if your nose is all stuffed up, the CPAP mm -hmm. is not going to be a good option for you. And then I also had the issue that um, when I had the sleep study done, they showed that my sleep efficiency was only at 60%. So you go to bed for eight hours, if you're able to get eight hours in bed with a two-year-old. And then of that time, I mean, I was only really sleeping a little less than maybe five hours. And then of that, you know, five hours, then I was being woken up about 12 times to go have these apneic episodes. Mm -hmm. And then I had the problem that I just couldn't get to sleep afterwards. Um, and because I thought I was going to go into anaphylaxis, it just became this really vicious cycle that I think my husband and I were pretty clear early on that we really needed to take some drastic measures to try to fix this because I wanted to be able to be present for my son and not have to worry about um, being able to breathe or if I was going to have to have him call 911 in the middle of the night. Sure, sure. And, you know, I think for people out there as well, talking about awareness and, and about your own condition and maybe even reaching out and helping other people, I think we talked about this when we, we had our, you know, our little practice run the other night that, you know, it's something that maybe when you talk to, you know, you're out maybe with your girlfriends or guy friends, whatever, and people are saying they're tired. Even for me, it's sometimes thinking, I just thought it was either my job like you, Anne, it's a demanding job and, you know, tiredness, fatigue, fogginess is just part of either A, your position, your stress level, and also part of aging. So, you know, it's great to put it out there and see, you know, different faces like you too um, that, are, that are going through this condition so that there is a more awareness out there. Yeah, I think it's unfortunate because I think women are eight times less likely to be diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea. So I think Aaron and I are especially lucky that we were even diagnosed. Sure, sure. And I think, Justine, for next year for um, Sleep Apnea Awareness Day, we should get T-shirts or something or have our own special color. <laughs> <laughs> Put it out there. So maybe yeah. we'll work on that for next year. <laughs> But I'm interested as well, um, Aaron. You know, you do, you were a relatively new mom, and and well, not you were a new mom, and you had a toddler as well. But for you, you know, what what sort of emotional and um, even mental aspects of you know the lack of sleep? What what made you become aware that this was um, something that you really needed to take care of? Well. Um, fairly soon after my first son was born, I, I started noticing a real deterioration in just my, my mental capacity, my memory, my ability to concentrate, um, keeping track of appointments and deadlines. And uh, I did a, a good deal of public speaking in my job and just being able to sort of present and carry on a coherent train of thought. Um, so, and you know, again, I, I chalked it up to being a mom and being up several times a night and I also was commuting and doing all this stuff. And, and uh, so it was, you know, working a full-time job. So it was, uh, you know, I just thought, well, this is natural, this is motherhood. Uh, but it, it really did start interfering with my job performance and it started interfering with my time with my kids. I was just so tired. I didn't really want to play with them. Um, 
So it really started affecting every aspect. And when I started the treatment eventually, it was a very dramatic shift for me. Um, the first time I put on the CPAP mask, it was incredible. They, I mean, they only did half a sleep study and my symptoms were so severe that they ended up um, doing the titration study halfway through, which is when they determined the air pressure. And when I put on that mask for the first time, it was such a relief. I mean, it was just, um, I, I just, I felt like I could breathe. I wasn't going to stop breathing all, you know, over and over again throughout the night. And, um, and so I'd still have some residual symptoms, but the treatment has been very, very effective for me. And uh, my husband's been incredibly supportive. And I've even found some ways to make it kind of fun. Um, I like to put an essential oil, just spread a little bit of it on the inside of the CPAP mask so that it smells really nice. And it's kind of a cue for me that it's, you know, time to relax and time to sleep. So Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've, I've actually been really, really happy with my CPAP and I just can't imagine going back to the way it was. Sure, sure. And, you know, I must add as well, Erin, you got involved last year with the um, patient panel. Um, so, you know, that's really great to have representation there as well. And Anne is actually one of our newest board members um, or members of the board. So, you know, it's so great to have you both on board with um, putting your stories out there, sharing your experience. And I will come to you because we talked about Erin and when she had her mask put on and she felt instant relief. Can you just tell the folks that are watching um, what your journey looked like? Because that is quite different. Yeah, I, I was put on the CPAP pretty much immediately after I was diagnosed, but I was counseled by the team at Stanford to let me know that probably the CPAP wasn't gonna be a good option for me long-term just because of the allergies. And initially I tried the CPAP and for me it was, you know, it's difficult to get to used to. I mean, in the beginning, you know, it was a matter of trying to be relaxed when you use a CPAP. So I tried different try techniques to try to relax when I put it on. Um, but then it's also hard because you're trying to listen for your two-year-old wow, the mask is on and it makes a lot of noise and I'm looking for the phone for work to see if I get any, you know, international calls and things like that. So it was kind of a, a CPAP was a really difficult option for me on a lot of different levels, but they counseled me that CPAP probably wasn't a great thing because of my allergies and really steered me toward um, maxillomandibular surgery, which is basically a surgery that moves your upper jaw and your lower jaw forward to be able to widen the airway because my airway was just too narrow. And I mean, it's a pretty drastic procedure, can be quite expensive too. So, I mean, it's not something that I went into lightly and my husband and I had a lot of conversations about about it because it's a matter of um, it's not just the surgery it was braces going into surgery it was going on a liquid diet for me for about a year and um, here I am you know all these years later I mean I had surgery five years ago and I'm still not really able to eat normally um, but my apnea has improved significantly because of that and um, while I still have to have really good sleep habits, you know, the, the surgery for me has been a terrific option. Wow, it sounds like it was quite the journey. Sorry, Justine, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, in, in listening to both of, of their stories, you know, some of the things that I, that I wrote down about, you know, kind of their awareness of what was happening with themselves and their families, um, you know, that's the thing. And I mean, I, anyone can relate to sleep deprivation, you know, whether you're, you're a new mom, a new parent um, with your job. And when you, when that takes place over years, because you have apnea, it, it is a very slow decline sometimes. And you don't realize right off the bat, um, you know, about your emotional and mental abilities changing. You know, you don't necessarily see that over the last five years, you've grown so irritable, the littlest thing sets you off, you know, and, you know, maybe if you're lucky, you have family and friends that can bring that to your attention. Um, and, you know, you might not notice things uh, at work right off the bat uh, either, you know, with your ability to, to, to perform and you just have a couple more cups of coffee and mask it over and, and push on through. But, um, but all of those things, you know, are, are 
common symptoms uh, uh, of having sleep apnea. I mean, you know, we talk about kind of the very physical aspects of it. You know, you wake up, you know, the, the snoring part, you wake up breathing, um, you know, gasping for air, you need to use the restroom a lot during the evening time, um, you know, while you're sleeping. But sometimes we don't talk about that softer side of it that it can have with you. And so, you know, today talking about awareness, um, you know, that's an important part for everybody to, to know and to communicate to those people around them, um, you know, those changes that are happening and, and, you know, to talk to your doctor about them. Yeah, you know, and I think it's good. It's worth highlighting as well as there's no, there's so many conditions out there that people are suffering from and not all are evident. Um, so, you know, people are like battling challenging diseases every day. Both of you look the picture of health, you know, and you're right. And you don't, you don't fit the, the profile. Even myself, if I tell people I wear a mask, people are shocked. Um, because they, they have that image. And again, that's why, you know, we want to put it out there. And, and it's great that we're doing this on Sleep Apnea Awareness Day because we want to make people aware that this affects a lot of people with different body types, um, different ages, pediatric patients. Justin's daughter was um, going through treatment as well. So, with the thick neck, um, who you walked up in the street. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, t I'm gonna talk a little bit over you, Kevin. All the time, you know? I'm gonna talk a little bit over you because you were getting a little garbled with the video. So, oh, uh, okay. yeah, you all were right. you were mentioning that is a good uh, point to bring up about, um, you know, my daughter. She is uh, 11 years old, and um, a lot of people don't really associate uh, sleep apnea uh, with pediatrics, but it's actually kind of common, um, more common than you think it is. And, you know, the, what we've been doing for her, she was diagnosed when she was about two and a half, and then she had her tonsils and adenoids taken out, and then she's had um, uh, various types of uh, orthodontic expanders in her mouth. And, um, you know, as she grows, we're just trying to keep up like Anne was saying her airway was very small and kind of you know I guess collapsed in a way due to her facial structure so we're just trying to make sure that as Mia grows and she's 11 that all of those things are as large as big as uh, you know be able to carry that that capacity so um, and and the and the other thing with pediatrics is that it runs in families I mean both of the ladies here today uh, talked about their parents, one of their parents or both being diagnosed. Um, and so it is something that runs in families due to the fact of you probably look alike and it's probably has something to do with your uh, facial features. And that's what it is for my daughter because she looks a little bit more like, um, like my husband and she inherited those those sleep apnea traits so um you know there is awareness to be to be um addressed with the pediatric aspect sure very important very important i mean i think we could touch on the fact now that you know once we have become aware and you know there is treatment out there and yes adherence to that treatment can be problematic for some people but Erin, I know you did touch on this, but maybe I'll get you to expand on it a little bit about, you know, how your life has changed since you've been diagnosed and um, are comfortably, by the sounds of things, wearing your, your CPAP mask each night. Sure. Um, I, I do wear my CPAP. I wear it every time I sleep. So I wear it all night, every night. And even if I take a nap during the day, I usually wear it then too. And I've almost found it to be very, a very calming influence. I mean, I felt that relief right away when I tried it the first time. Um, just because I felt like, oh my, I'm finally, I'm not going to be gasping for breath. I'm not going to wake up with that feeling of, you know, suffocating. And, um, it really has changed a lot of things for me. I mean, I, I still have you know some struggles with memory and concentration. I don't think I'm back to the point I was before I had my kids. Um, 
but I, it, it's definitely a lot better than when I was living with untreated sleep apnea. And, you know, my stress levels are down and my just level of irritability is down. Um, it, it, I've really seen a lot of improvement in sort of the mental and emotional, those, those softer sides that Justine was talking about. Um, and I've, I've noticed other things too. I've had um, chronic pain in my back and I've noticed some reduction in that. And I think that might be partly due to just, you know, I have fewer stress hormones coursing through my body the whole time. So, uh, you know, it, it can make it really difficult for your body to deal with anything else. Um, I'm also not getting ill as often as I used to. I used to get sick all the time. Um, everything that came through, I would seem to, to catch it. And uh, my, my health just generally has been a lot better since I started the CPAP treatment. You know, I'm actually going to add on to that, Erin. I completely agree with Erin when she talks about the fact that she used to get sick all the time. I, you know, since being diagnosed and being treated for sleep apnea, I get sick so less often than I used to. It was amazing. Something would come through the office when I had, before I was treated, I would immediately get it. So I absolutely agree with you. Yeah, no, and I think that's a great point. And I, I feel that a lot of people I've heard that before where they're not getting as many flus or colds and your whole immune system is boost because obviously, you know, we feel bad. Were you going to say something, Justine? Yeah, I know, because you keep breaking up a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and oh my, I don't know what's going on. I'm so sorry with my connection. <laughs> um, but, but yes, I mean, that's an impo important um, part that uh, Aaron has mentioned and brought up is that you know, sleep is the time that your body is, is repairing and healing. And so, um, you know, when everything is interrupted and, um, and, and, you know, and the efficiency is not there, then your body's not able to do what it needs, what it needs to do, which is boost its immune system, fight off a little tiny cold, a little germ, a little virus. And um, I can say, um, you know, at least from the aspect of, of, of my daughter, um, you know, now that she's 11, uh, she w was wearing her CPAP pretty, um, pretty ritually every night in this past, maybe say so, or so now that she's getting a little older, maybe not so much. And um, the allergies here where we live in Florida have just been off the charts this year. And it, it, her allergies are off the charts. And I think it's because she can't, you know, her body's trying to fight all the allergies and things that are going on. And, you know, she's not wearing it that often. So she's having a few issues to deal with. Sure, sure. And I think it's worth, I hope my, I realize my laptop is like a little bit hot here. So I'm hoping that's not the reason. <laughs> um, you know, I think we have Teresa as well in the background that was going to fuel some questions on our Awake Facebook page. I'm just wondering if anybody out there has any questions, particularly for Erin or Anne uh, or Justine or myself. Yeah, she was uh, one here uh, that she had sent across from, um, I believe the first name is Heal, talking about a, a full face mask leaking so much around the mouth. Any any help with that? Um, did you experience that, Erin? I don't know what type of mask you use. It sounds like Anne may have tried a little bit more of the nasal mask, which you know wasn't wasn't the best choice for her. But what do you use, and do you experience any leaks? You have any? I, I do use a full face mask as well, and I that has been it's probably the biggest problem I've dealt with with the CPAP. Um, you know, I've found trying to keep the mask as clean as I can uh, helps with it. Um, sometimes just readjusting the pressure, and it, some, it seems like sometimes uh, having it looser it sort of ironically seems like it it's uh, actually helps it stay pressed against my face better. So I, I think that is one of the issues I've dealt with is that some nights it just seems like it's leaking air all over the place and it's waking me up. Um, but usually if I try adjusting the straps, that helps a little bit, just, you know, 
pull it a little tighter at the top or a little tighter at the bottom or loosen it up. And, you know, it's kind of just trial and error, I found. Um, and I had, you know, one mask too that just didn't seem to be fitting very well at all. Um, and so I think I might have just gotten a bad mask that wasn't so, you know, I kind of just threw that one out and, and got a different one and then it was working better for me. So uh, I think occasionally there can be one that's just not up to snuff and, and uh, causes problems, but it's, it's one of the issues that I still deal with, but I've, I've kind of found my little tips and tricks of playing with the, the tightness and the looseness and, and, and I've made it work. I think one of the things that we can say, you know, today on Sleep Apnea Awareness Day that the, if you want to call them the struggles of using the mask, definitely outweigh, uh, wait, the benefits outweigh the struggles mm -hmm. of using mm -hmm. the mask. <laughs> so now everybody goes through the same, you know, it's a very common question. It's the mask, it's the leaking, it's uncomfortable, it's, you know, the marks, and, and, and there are just a thousand tips, and one works for a different person all the time. Um, so it's just, you never know what it's going to be. You just have to start down the list and, 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 and keep trying because, um, as I clearly want to say, the benefits definitely outweigh um, you not using the machine and getting the, the treatment, the treatment that you need. Um, if I could jump in for a second too, one of the things you mentioned was the marks. I found a really helpful tip for that is to use uh, moleskin or something like that that you'd use for like hiking and preventing blisters. If I start to get a place that's a little irritated, I'll put a small patch of that on my face and just where the mask would rub and it really, really helps. Uh, you know, with a, a day or a night or two of using that and it's all cleared up and I'm back to normal. So. Mm -hmm. Great idea. That same individual that was talking about the mask leaks um, was also saying that, you know, sh uh, that they had just been diagnosed. Uh, also dealing with, you know, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, and a fatty liver issue at the age of 42. So, yep, mm -hmm. that's not uncommon, um, no. but we're happy that, you know, that you're, you're working on getting uh, your apnea, your sleep apnea under control and, and working towards using the machine, and hopefully that will um, take a little bit of pressure or maybe off some of the other co-conditions that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think too, for me, one of the great benefits of getting the sleep apnea treated is that it really helped me um, deal with some other health issues I had um, in that I was able to get, you know, I had the energy to get more exercise. And so I could, you know, start um, taking care of some of my back problems. And I was able to, uh, what did I want to say? Lost my train of thought. See, it still happens. But <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I was able to, I tried losing weight before I got the sleep apnea treated and, you know, I was doing all the, the things you're supposed to do and it just didn't work, didn't work, didn't work. And then I was doing the same things after I started getting the CPAP treatment and I've lost over 30 pounds. So, um, you know, it's really, I, I think it's kind of a, it can help you with so many other health issues that just your immune system's working better and you have more energy to do the things you need mm -hmm. to do. And it, so I hope that um, you see those results that, that it can sort of lift up your entire uh, well-being. Yeah. And I think as you get more energized, you're right. You're more inclined to go to the gym or once you start taking care of yourself as well, and you realize that you have a condition that you need to manage then you realize too that there's other factors that can influence that condition. So, you know, losing weight can certainly help. Good sleep habits can certainly help. So it's great that that's um, motivated you to do that. And, and those things of, you know, having enough energy to exercise and, you know, checking out your diet and, you know, potentially losing some weight, those have great effects on other conditions that an individual might have, you know, whether you have high cholesterol or diabetes or high blood pressure, I mean, all of those things, it kind of, it's that nice big blanket that goes over all of the 
common conditions that a lot of uh, people are dealing with in our community. And Anne, can I ask you, how do you feel your life has changed? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is I really prioritize sleep now and the importance of it. You know, the whole idea of, you know, evangelizing that it's important to get eight hours of sleep a night, that it's not a badge of honor to be able to, to just live your life with four. And then just making sure that I don't eat too close to bedtime, you know, not, you know, caffeine close to bedtime. I try to get the right amount of exercise, you know, just try to live a healthy life. But really, number one thing in my life, you know, next to my family is really prioritizing sleep. Sure. That's great. You know, one thing that I thought about as well when we talked the other night, um, you know, when we are talking, the whole theme today is awareness, and, and that seems to be the mantra. But it's, it's important for us to be aware of, you know, what our bodies are doing. It's important for us to advocate for ourselves when we go and see a family physician, for example, to make them think that this could be something that you're actually um, suffering from. But the other thing is, Aaron, I know when you actually were diagnosed, it would be great to have it out there for an almost awareness campaign to have the, the time from diagnosis, when you said you had your sleep study done that night and it was instant relief, but can you just tell the people out there that are listening, you know, or watching what, what happened in between time? Because I know there was a bit of a delay. Sure. Um, there was, I, it was, I think, August of 2017 that I first made the decision that I really needed to get the sleep study. I had a terrible night and woke up just gasping for breath and I was in a panic and I was like, okay, I've absolutely got to do something about this. My doctor got me in right away and made their um, appointment for the sleep study right away, but they couldn't get me into the sleep study for six weeks. So, uh, you know, I was just desperate mm -hmm. to get this treated and it took me six weeks to get into the sleep study. Um, once they identified severe obstructive sleep apnea at the sleep study, um, it was then a month, uh, you know, a few days shy of a month, I think, before I got my CPAP machine at home. And so, you know, it was very frustrating during that month to have experienced the relief of having the CPAP while I was in the sleep study and to know that it could be helping me and that, you know, I could be getting better sleep and feeling better and not not to have it right away. So that was that was very frustrating to me. And at the time, I didn't really know that that wait period wasn't normal. Or you know, maybe it, maybe it is fairly normal. But you know, it's it's kind of ridiculous if you get diagnosed with something else that's so serious and that has such a huge impact on your life. They don't tell you, well, okay, you know, wait a month to get treated. I mean, they're like, no, we're going to do this right now and start taking care of it. So. I think that's an area where there's a lot of room for improvement. I think the other thing that's important too is that once you get fitted with the CPAP, there's so many different places that you can um, either go to or sometimes you have to make figure out how to make the CPAP work yourself. So, I mean, I was lucky enough to be sent to a place where they fitted me for a CPAP um, mask and they did follow-up appointments to make sure that it was working well for me so I wasn't just left on my own so I think that really helped and they looked at you know my numbers to see you know how well a night um, the um, how many hours a night I was getting how many hours a night I was wearing the CPAP successfully so that I think that really helped sure yeah and it's a shame really because you're right Aaron if you have another condition you generally walk out with a prescription that you go and fill Mm -hmm. Yes. Justin, any other questions from people right there? Um, there was one gentleman, Victor, he's talking again about uh, mask issues that he has. And well, yep, for nasal pillows um, and uh, full face masks because he has a lot of nasal, con nasal congestion, which you know, Anne is unfortunately an expert of. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, I think sometimes in regards to that, it's, you know, without knowing the full story of Victor, it's, you know, it is a little bit of a vicious cycle, as I was describing with my daughter, you know, she's kind of slacking on wearing the machine a little bit. So now the allergies are kicking in. And so now it's a little harder to wear the machine because you are congested, you know, so you're, you find yourself in this, this little cycle that's going around. Um, 
So, um, I mean, there are definitely, I would say, you know, talk to your doctor to see what is causing the congestion, if it is allergies or something else, um, and see if you can get that under control that could, you know, then help your ability to, uh, to wear the mask. That was a big part for me, Justine, because even before um, I started the surgery pathway, the doctor really made sure that I was stable before I got the surgery. So I had to go through at the time when I first started getting allergy shots four times a week, four shots four times a week. So I mean, it was considerable, um, a considerable investment in my own time to go through that every week and then um, getting different medicines, not just over the counter, a lot of different injectables to just get myself mm -hmm. stable so that my allergies were cleaned up. Because it, unless you get your allergies cleaned up, like Justine said, I mean, it's just a really bad cycle. So, I mean, you have to just commit. I mean, in some ways, I looked at that time of my life as this whole journey, it was a hobby for me to try to, you know, figure out how I was going to manage these allergies because I just couldn't do it any longer. And it, it was the one thing that was getting in the way of me treating that sleep apnea. So you've really got to clean that up before you get, you know, before you're really to su have successful therapy with sleep apnea. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And unfortunately, yeah, a lot of people suffer from other elements that, you know, can get in the way of their therapy. So, you know, that's, that's great advice. And I, I think that is an, uh, an important, um, aspect that Anne was talking about that, you know, when you find yourself dealing with various types of conditions, I mean, the amount of time that you have to travel to and from doctors, take off work, do all of this, it, it, it can be overwhelming. It is overwhelming. You know, um, you know, people, they need to have their job. They need to take care of their family. They need to do all of these things. And they just, it does become it can be a hobby if you want it to be. Um, and you have to. You have to make it a priority if you want to, you know, you're either going to pay now and invest the time now and try to get good health now or later, it's just going to catch up to you. So, I mean, that's kind of the way we looked at it. And that's why we ended up going down the road we did and deciding to go through surgery, even though it was the worst time in our lives with a two-year-old to have mom's mouth wired shut for such a long time because of the surgery. Right. But, but right. It was a key decision for us. And I'm really glad we made it. And I mean, that even, it, it even loops back around to, you know, this being Sleep Apnea Awareness Day of, you know, of individuals that are concerned about family, friends, you know, spouses, whomever that's, you know, close to them in their life, you know, to convince them to try to make it a priority as best that you can. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, like you said, it's either invest it now or there's more coming, you know, down, down the path. And so, um, you know, it's not always comfortable and it's not always fun and, you know, all of those great things. But, you know, if, if, if you can find a good doctor and, you know, get kind of a team together, because sometimes that's what it is too. It's a team of people. It's not just your, your, um, primary care physician. It could be your allergist and your dentist and, and your, you know, DME and your sleep doctor and your cardiologist. And, you know, there's, but if, you know, if you give it a, a, a good couple of years, then hopefully you can get it under control and then just monitor. And prevent, prevent some of those comorbidities that are associated with the, you know, sleep apnea. So mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Well, Justin, if there's no other questions, or are there? Yeah, no, that's about it. There's a lot of comments and people agreeing and, you know, saying that that's, you know, how they feel or their experience. But yeah, we're pretty good with the, with the questions. Great, great. Well, listen, guys, um, I want to thank you both. And of course, Justine for being in here as well. But Aaron and Ann, it's been great that you guys have put yourself forward and uh, stepped out of your comfort zone for the want of a better word to share your story. I think it's very valuable that people will hopefully, you know, maybe relate to you as well. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for your time and everybody out there have a great um, sleep apnea awareness day. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.